A'udhu Billah Min Ash-Shaytan Ar-Rajim Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim In the name of God, most merciful, ever merciful, and may God's peace and blessings be upon His Holy Prophet Muhammad and the purified members of His household and progeny. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajal farajah. Brothers, sisters, respected viewers, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome once again to uh, a new section, insha'Allah, that we are beginning now in our life series. We are still under the theme of knowledge and intellect, but we are about to start a new heading or a new section. This one dedicated to understanding the action that results from knowledge. So because we uh, are introducing a new section, uh, in case there are people who are joining newly, uh, and simply because it makes sense to make sure that uh, how this section fits into the larger series is clear, uh, let's spend a bit of time to provide an overview of the series until now so that we know where we came from, why we're talking about this section here, and where we're trying to go. The Initially, the life series that uh, we've been going through, I believe at uh, 27 or 28 previous lectures, began with the notion that today we live in a very complex world, a world full of ambiguity, uh, confusion for many of us and the complexity that uh, we talk about as we saw uh, can be generalized to basically every dimension of life the social dimension the financial the political uh, the technological the military the religious even the the bodily and health uh, dimensions are all impacted by this complexity and so this, of course, leads to also a lack of clarity on what, therefore, we need to do and how we ought to live our lives. And the question is how we're supposed to live our lives is a lot more relevant to us because we are believers. Because we are Muslims and believers, this question becomes a lot more pressing and a lot more important for us. In the previous series, and so for anyone joining, we established and we argued, inshallah, very clearly that we believe that our religion provides us with a complete overview or complete outlook, complete worldview in how we're supposed to live, our general attitude towards every aspect of life, all of the major dimensions of life, we believe are covered by this religion and we believe that this religion has valid things and relevant things to say about every major aspect of our lives our day-to-day -day lives and um, this means that because our religion is divinely inspired we believe that only the Creator only a divine source can give us the answers to a lot of the questions that humanity struggles with because we're trying to find a balance between what ought to be done to reach individual happiness as well as collective happiness and what we need to do to achieve happiness in this world as well as happiness for the next world and the next life and this is not something that human beings can experiment on and evolve into and develop on their own because we don't have access to a lot of the components that we're trying to solve and we're trying to explore and understand. Some of it we do, a lot of it we don't. And so we definitely need an additional layer, an additional hand to support us at least to cover those things that, are, that cannot be covered with any certainty by human beings. And the history of humanity is accessible to all today to see how humanity has still struggled and continues to struggle with a lot of the major issues that they were struggling with 2,000 or 5,000 years ago. Okay, so all of the major issues that provide meaning and direction and guidance to the life of a human being are still very much issues 
that lead to huge struggles, individual and social ones. Okay, so we're not going to go through uh, all of that again. But as we said, we believe that, therefore, the religion that we follow, because it's divinely inspired, because it's a religion that came to humanity, we believe that is meant to be followed, not only by the people who, to whom it was initially revealed, but to everyone else that will come afterwards, including us today and generations to come. We believe that this religion is able, therefore, to provide the general outlook, the solutions, the answers, the general principles upon which we can base our lives. And so it becomes a lot more important for us today. The more complexity we find in the world, the more it becomes important, necessary for us to go back to those religious teachings to, say, to see what is it that this religion says about making sense and finding our way through this complexity, this ambiguity, this confusion. This was the initial trigger for the series. And we said, therefore, that in a lot of, for the, the case for a lot of us, it's no longer going to be sufficient. It's no longer going to be enough for us to have a superficial understanding of religion. The superficial layer of understanding is not going to be enough to give us those answers. We therefore need to go back to the primary sources of religion and to extract the teachings from those primary sources, from the Holy Quran, from the tradition of the Holy Prophet as well as the purified members of his household through their sayings, through the principles they taught. We need to be able to extract principles that we can then apply to our lives. And this is going to give us not the superficial understanding or the case-by-case -case understanding of religion. It's going to give us the spirit of religion. It's going to give us general principles that then each of us can take back to day-to-day -day life, everyday life, and apply to the situations that we're encountering and the situations that we've been describing as being extremely complex and confusing and ambiguous, a lot more than things were 50 years ago or 200 years ago or 1,000 or 1,400 years ago. Okay, so we believe that the answers are still in religion, except that if we want to follow the beaten path, the superficial understanding, we may not be able to get to these principles. That's why it requires kind of a customized way to dig through religion, specifically by aiming to find answers to these types of complexities that we're finding nowadays in uh, our world. So we're making an extra effort as we go in this series to make sure that we find a balance or we make the balance in our religion clear. It's not something that we're imposing on our religion. It's not something that we're superimposing or projecting on our religion. We believe that in Islam there is a, ba a balance between the individual reality and the collective reality. And the collective is addressed in Islam at the level of the family, at the level of the community, at the level of society, at the level of human history. We talked even about a new notion of understanding community that we basically put together here, which is community based on an ideological or intentional based on your intentions and intentional dimension you are able to create a community not only across space with people who live halfway across the world from you but across time as well the community that islam talks about and to which you belong you can have an identity within that community is a community based on your intentions when there is a commonality in intentions, it creates a community. And the more of it there is, the more we get to a community. So in Islam, we're trying to show in each one of these topics that we're addressing, and this is very important because this is one of the main themes in today's world, a world that is dominated by an individualistic drive, right? So this is a theme that the world struggles with. Where do we find the right balance? How do we move in a way, how do we act in a way in this world that strikes the right balance between the individual and the collective, right? So in everything we're talking about, we keep going back and forth, we oscillate 
in every discussion that we're having between what Islam says and how it is to be interpreted at an individual level as well as a collective level. And then for us as believers in an afterlife that we come from a divine source and we're going back to a divine source, we can't just talk about things that have to do with the afterlife because we live in this world now. And we can't only talk about things about this world and the happiness of this world and the material achievements and accomplishments that we can get to in this world without thinking of the afterlife, our eternal life. And so it's also a matter in every topic that we address of finding the balance between what achieves, what gives us the maximum happiness or benefit for this world and the next world. It can be one or the other. We don't believe in that. We believe in both at the same time. Okay, so this is what we've been trying to do in every part of the series. And so this is obviously we're saying this because all of this is still going to apply to the topic that we're going to be addressing next. Okay, so we're trying to show the, the holistic, we called it at some point, the, the multifaceted, multidimensional aspects of our religion that it, its depth, its complexity, that it's still relevant, that it is still valid for everything that humanity struggles with today, and that's what makes it universal. That's our claim that our religion is universal. If we are unable to do this, then it becomes an empty claim. If we just say our religion is actually a universal or universalist religion, but we cannot show how it is relevant to the issues that humanity deals with today, then this remains an empty claim. So we have a lot of work to do, especially because the struggles and the issues that the world is constantly facing are growing. And so there's constantly more and more catching up for us to do for ourselves to make sense of all of this, and then to explain this to the world, to show that we truly do believe that we have answers in this religion. So we have to be the ones leading the charge, taking the initiative and showing how does our religion answer these questions? How does it provide relevant, valid solutions to some of these struggles humanity is faced with? And so we structured the entire series from the beginning. We said we're going to structure it based on priorities. And we began with the one that we believe is the highest order of priority, the most important. And this is something that was validated by a number of points that this is the most important one, namely the knowledge and intellect theme, l'ilm aql right? And we said this becomes our first theme, and we've been going through it since the beginning. One of the reasons we gave for this is that we said within our religion, we find that our religion itself positions the intellect and knowledge as being the most important dimension of a human being, the most important part, the most important dimension, realm, call it whatever you want, of a human being. We need to start there. If we want to follow the teachings of Islam from the beginning, we have no choice but to begin with ilm and ma'rifah and aql, those two together. Okay, so that's one. Two, when we look at the state of the world today, we also saw that this is after 21 plus centuries of development, this is where humanity is today. The latest turn in humanity is the one that basically made the most advanced, the most evolved societies in the world move towards becoming and trying to become increasingly knowledge societies. Societies where knowledge is the entire infrastructure of power is built on the notion of knowledge, of data, information, and knowledge. Okay, you use each to go to the next level, ultimately having knowledge societies. And we talked about all of this at the beginning, and we gave the, uh, a good, I think, introduction to all of this. So the state of the world today is one in which the main capital, the main source of power in the world at an individual level and at a social level is knowledge. Therefore, we need to go back to our religion and see what does our religion say? Does it say anything about knowledge or not? And what does it say about knowledge that we can use, that we can apply, that we can translate into this reality of the world that the world has moved into? Maybe five centuries ago, no one would have understood what Islam was talking about. 
But today we don't have that excuse when the whole world is talking about moving into trying to become knowledge societies. Did our religion not talk about all of this 14 centuries ago? Did it not make knowledge the primary, the most, the highest order of priority in all of its teachings? Did it not try to build the human being with the knowledge and intellect as the core and the first brick, the cornerstone, and everything else is built around it? And that's what, so we saw Islamically and religiously, we have to start from knowledge and intellect. The state of the world, because the whole series is meant to address the real world issues that we're facing, well, the real world issues today start from knowledge societies. This is the state of the world today, and this is where everyone is trying to move to. So that's a second imperative, a second driver. And then the third one, therefore, logic dictates that we need to look at ourselves individually and collectively as people, as persons, each of us, individuals, and as communities. And again, I leave it to you to apply this at the level of the family, at the level of a community and a neighborhood, at the level of a ummah, at the level of a society, at the level of a civilization. That's up to each of you to apply him to. To see how do we need to rewire ourselves, to reformat our thinking based on Islamic teachings so that we can actually progress and evolve and produce in this world based on the teachings of Islam, in a world that is moving towards these knowledge societies after this knowledge revolution. This is what we're trying to do. This is where we're trying to what we're trying to move towards. And yes, so therefore, if we're trying to rewire ourselves and reformat ourselves, change entirely from within how we view the world and therefore eventually how we act in the world, we have to start from the beginning. And to do that, we have to begin from knowledge and intellect, because that's where everything stems from. Okay, so therefore, once this is all understood, we began the series. Now we can go a lot faster. The rest is easy. So we began the series with trying to provide a quick glimpse, a good view, overview of the importance of knowledge and intellect in Islam. But this was, in truth, just to get a real good taste of what it is. Because, in fact, we need the whole series, this whole theme in the series, to fully appreciate that. But that was the first section, to really try to understand the importance, the merit, the value, the worth that our religion gives to knowledge and intellect, ilm and ma'rifah and aql. And we also spent a bit of time to establish the justification for this importance as it is provided in the Holy Quran. So we went through a number of verses of the Holy Quran, perhaps almost 30 verses of the Holy Quran or sections of verses to establish very clearly, to argue very clearly, and this is important because as we said, we're trying to show that everything we're doing is based on the primary sources in our religion. This is not a interpretation of this is not a two three four layers removed we're going to the primary sources very intentionally okay so when we went to the verses of the holy quran we found the justification for the importance that our religion gives to knowledge and intellect then we went to the other side we said okay but this looks like maybe a lot of work a lot of effort and maybe this is not you know, everyone's cup of tea, as they say. So what's the alternative? Do I really need to, each and every one of us, do we really need to move in this direction of acquiring knowledge and working on the aql and making sure that it meets the definition that Islam is giving? Or do we have an alternative? And we found in the, in the traditions, we found in the narrations that the only alternative is jahl. The only alternative is on one side, lack of knowledge, so lack of ilm, so ignorance, and on the other side, lack of aql, which is, we called it foolishness. So ignorance and foolishness, both of them together, to translate the notion of jahl that we found. We said there's a theoretical component to it, and there's a more practical component to it. 
On one side, it is the opposite of the knowledge that you have. On the other side, it's the opposite of wisdom and judgment and intellect. Okay, so we call that foolishness. And when we looked at what foolishness has to say about, uh, what, what Islam has to say about foolishness, we saw clearly that this cannot be an option. Jahl is the only alternative, and what is said about it can never be acceptable for any of us. We cannot accept this for ourselves as individuals, and we can't accept this for ourselves as communities. So we have to go back to ilm, and we have to go back to aql. So where do we start, and where do we go from here? The next logical question should have been, Okay, so which knowledge do I start with? Which type of knowledge do I go after? But this question is actually not very accurate or not very Islamic because we found that Islam is saying any knowledge can become Islamic. It's not so much the content. It's not so much the substance of the knowledge. Although that is important and we will talk about it, but there's something that has to happen before. There are two conditions that have to be met for that knowledge to become Islamic. If those two conditions are met, then you are in a very good position to call the information that you're working with Islamic knowledge. You can consider this knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala considers to be exactly what he wants you to be working on, to be acting on. And those two conditions are that you have the right intentions, and the intention alone transforms a thing, any neutral thing, into good or bad. And it has to be information that is transformational. Or what we have called, and what we're about to begin doing, we call it action. To simplify it. But the truth is, until now, clearly, we've seen that knowledge has to meet two conditions. The first is that, you have to acquire it and you have to use it with the intention that you are going to do good with it. That you are going to become a better human being with this knowledge. That you're going to do this for the sake of Allah. To please Allah. To get the satisfaction of Allah of you and what you're doing with your life. That's the first thing that you have to check off. That's the intent. The second condition, and inshallah this is what we finished and we recapped in a long two-hour recap the last time we met. The second condition is what we are calling action. Knowledge that you acquire must translate into action. There is action that has to happen internally and there is action that has to happen externally. But it needs to become action. If the knowledge you acquire meets those conditions of being with the right intent and translates into action, then it becomes Islamic knowledge. That's all we're trying to say. And now we want to explain in detail what we mean by action. So there's an important point here that I will repeat, as I said earlier, and when we talked about sincerity, for instance, although in the case of sincerity, there was interest in the topic, so we spent more time on it, the idea behind sincerity was simply to explore it to the extent we need it for knowledge. And so, what is the intent of acquiring the knowledge? That was the real question. But because there was a lot of interest in this, these notions of niyyah and ikhlas on Islam, which we encountered when we did that, we spent a bit of time, we opened a bracket, and we spent a bit of time on the notions of niyyah and ikhlas in general in Islam, not limited to knowledge. And inshallah, it was useful and, and relevant. Okay, so we are going to face the same issue when we're going to talk about action. Our focus here is action that derives out of knowledge and, so there's a two-way relationship. There's knowledge-action or action-knowledge relationship. Okay, and this is what will get us to talk about from the beginning. One, the importance of Knowledge becoming action in Islam. That's one. How does this apply to knowledge becoming action? What does it mean for me? So I have to look at it as an individual. And then I have to look at it, look at it as a community. So as an individual, what would it mean? 
It means that first I have to acquire knowledge. So this puts me under a specific heading in Islam. I become a learner. I become a muta'allim. I become a talib ilm. The moment I start moving, taking steps to acquire knowledge in Islam. And this is not a black and white process. It's a relative process. Because no one has ever done acquiring knowledge. But while you're acquiring knowledge, at some point, you get enough information about a topic that you start becoming a carrier of that knowledge in that specific topic. You become a scholar. You become someone who can now share that knowledge with someone else. Distrib distribute that knowledge to someone else. And so the series is built on this. First, that we understand the general importance that Islam gives to knowledge becoming action. Once this is done, then we will look at, therefore, we must move on that path. I must act on now the knowledge that I have received in this series, which means I have to acquire knowledge. Once I have acquired knowledge, or enough of it, then I get a responsibility of sharing that knowledge. One, of acting on that knowledge, and two, of sharing that knowledge with others. If this actually starts happening, then we can talk about the next layer. So up to this point, we're talking about individual ingredients. But these ingredients should logically move us to the next layer, the next order of magnitude, which is what would happen to the community. If these people are together, they are creating a community of knowledge. So what does Islam say about this notion? Do we find it anywhere? Where people are have a relationship with each, with each other based on knowledge. And we would guess that given the importance Islam has given to this topic, that we're probably going to find some very useful things that we can bring back to our very practical day-to-day -day lives. And that will help us, inshallah, move towards the creation of communities of knowledge. What does it mean to spread knowledge? How is it done? What are the merits? What are the characteristics? What are the duties of the learner? What are the duties of the scholar? What's the best way to spread knowledge? All of that to lead us to the notion, inshallah, of knowing what it means to have communities of knowledge. So this is where we're trying to go with this. We will also add in the introductory part where we're trying to understand this first notion of, first, let's be clear that Islam gives a lot of importance to knowledge becoming action or transformational, as we called it. Okay, Knowledge that transform you, transforms you, each person who acquires it, on the inside so that it changes your outlook so that it changes your worldview and therefore makes you act or makes you act differently. This is the knowledge that Islam talks about. Now that I know, if I really know, then this needs to show in my actions. And my actions can also include how I view the world. My worldview changes, my attitude changes, my opinions change, and then my actions change. So it's transformational. It changes you. It changes you cognitively and mentally and psychologically. It also changes you spiritually. And then you have the actions that follow. So this whole part is dedicated to this section, to this heading of action or transformation that results from knowledge. Okay, In this specific sense that we explained. Inshallah, when this is done, then we will finish the two conditions. We will have finished the two conditions that allow us to say that this knowledge is Islamic. Then we will look at a specific emphasis that Islam has put on a few types of knowledge. And so there are many of them, and we've mentioned some of them in the past, especially as we went through the verses of the Holy Quran. We saw how the Holy Quran puts a lot of emphasis on specific types of knowledge, but now that we're equipped with all of this, we can broaden and apply this to everything. And so there are a few notions there that we want to spend a bit more time on because they're usually not addressed a lot. For instance, history. 
and what Islam says about studying history. And, you know, in discussions, in our side discussions, there was a lot of interest in that, so we'll spend a little bit more time there. With the notion of action, for instance, or the transformational knowledge that now we're talking about, there's also the whole notion, for instance, of, you know, is this when we're talking about duties, responsibilities, once that you know, is this limited to Islam? Or is this, or is this something that is generally accepted by human beings? Okay, and I want to focus on a theme that is near and dear to me, that I've always thought about and wondered about and discussed at length and studied, specifically what I call the role of the intellectual in society. And the idea between behind this series, and this is what is the difference between someone who is an intellectual and who is not, all I'm going to say is, we began the series by saying it's not enough to have a superficial understanding of religion. The moment you're going in depth in your knowledge of things, you want to see and understand things in how they truly are, you have that desire and you have that motivation and the patience, the perseverance, the resilience to actually do this because this is not an easy task to do. That's it. You are in a different category of human beings. That puts you in an elite position, unfortunately, but that is the truth. And so what does that entail in terms of responsibility? Are we the only ones who talk about this? So we're going to come back to see, and depending on your level of interest, we can do it very quickly or spend time on this, to explore the non-Islamic version of this, to see how we find the equivalent or the parallel of this in society at large. Okay? So I think with this we have uh, enough to begin the, the, the series, inshallah. We know where we were and where we came from and why we're talking about this specific heading at this point here and where we're trying to go once we're done with this. As we said, inshallah, the next section will be that of the types of knowledge that Islam says we need to acquire. Okay, so without further uh, procrastination or ado, um, we can begin the, the, this section. So with the first heading in the section on action or transformation uh, ensuing or resulting from knowledge. And as we said, the first part that we're starting now, which is in a way introductory, but it's more, it's not just an introduction. It's really to understand the importance that Islam gives in knowledge becoming action. Okay, so each one, of course, of the headings that I gave you guys uh, are going to be a lot more detailed than what, what I just gave. Each one of these is going to have headings and subheadings under them. Okay, so we're going to look at this first notion, and you will see that we have a few headings to cover. And then we will look at the learner in a number of headings. We will look at the scholar and those who carry knowledge in a number of headings. And we have a few more headings that we'll get to when we get there. Okay, so when we talk about what Islam says about knowledge having to become action. Okay, so this is, remember, the second condition for knowledge to be Islamic, that it needs to be transformational. It needs to lead or translate into action. The first hadith from Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, غَايَةُ ilm حُسْنُ amal." The end result or the objective of knowledge, غَايَةُ ilm حُسْنُ amal," is to act appropriately, is to act in a good way, is to act righteously or virtuously, depending on the type of slant you want to give. Husn could be something moral, so it could be virtuous and righteous, or it could be just good action. The objective of knowledge is not its own sake. You do not learn to learn. Although knowledge carries worth, and we saw that when we talked about it, it does need to translate into action. Okay? Husnul amal has to be the result of knowledge, otherwise we're not really talking about knowledge. The second hadith, again from Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, Kamalul ilm al amal. So Kamal could be understood as perfection, could be understood as the completeness. Kamalul ilm, so 
When you have knowledge, that knowledge is partial. To be fulfilled, to be complete, or to be perfected, that knowledge has to become action. Kamalul ilm al amal. Very clear. The next hadith, again from Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, Ma alima man lam ya'mal bi'ilmah. Ma alima man lam ya'mal bi'ilmah. So, to properly translate it, we would say, he has no knowledge, the one who does not act upon their knowledge, or who has not acted upon their knowledge. Okay, The one who does not act upon their knowledge, to switch it and say it more naturally in English, the one who does not act upon their knowledge, cannot be said to have knowledge. If the knowledge does not become action, it is not knowledge. We're starting with the very clear ones so that everything is uh, clear from the beginning. There's another saying from Imam Ali alayhi salam in which, very short, he says, Al-ilmu bil-amal. Knowledge is through action. Now here we can add a number of different interpretations. The, the clear one and the one we've been talking about is that for knowledge to be knowledge, it can only be evaluated or assessed or you know, proven through action. Al-ilmu bil-amal. You want to say that I have knowledge? It needs to be shown. This needs to manifest itself in your action. Okay? We could also add to it, and inshallah, I don't think today, today I want to keep it short, um, but inshallah, we will see that the imam will talk about this other notion of how do you acquire knowledge. Well, one way to acquire knowledge is also through work and action. Okay? So there is a cycle there that you learn, you do, and the action leads to more knowledge. Right? So there is a relationship that we've talked about in the past, a little bit of a cycle. So this is one way to understand it. When the Imam says, Al-ilmu bil-amal, it's not only that you prove it or you assess it or you demonstrate it through knowledge. You may also acquire it through knowledge. To achieve or to acquire knowledge is also through action. And this could be very simply explained. Today they talk about experiential knowledge or experiential training or learning. If you go to any you know, corporate world reality, you're going to get some very theoretical knowledge. So this is when you maybe sit in front of a computer and you do a page turner, as they call them. right? You just flip through the pages and they have information. You finish all of those. Every section has quizzes, something to evaluate the learning took place, something like that. Okay? And so this is what they call formal learning in today's world. Or you sit in a classroom and someone teaches you and you go through the activities. This is all formal learning. And then there is informal learning. Okay? And there's experiential learning, which is what? I'm not going to give... I may give you some notions, but that's not the learning part I'm focused on. I'm going to throw you into a situation and you're going to learn by being in that job, by managing that project, by supervising those people, by handling that file. That's how you're going to learn. And of course, you add to it coaching and mentoring and other tools. But the learning is taking place through experience. That's how you really learn. And then you consult other people and that's your informal learning. That's when you get peer coaching and you get help from other people and you ask them, how did you learn and how, what can you teach me here and how was your experience and here's what applies and what doesn't. And if you go back to the training and learning world, you see that the way they split this up, they say it's a 70, 20, 10. Only 10% of what you learn is through the formal. If you want to have a successful organization, only 10% is done through the formal. You need to put a lot more effort in place to create a culture of learning and communities of knowledge where people want to naturally learn, you go out of your way and you leave your comfort zone to be because you feel safe to learn and to make mistakes. That's the best organizations in the world. They move in that direction. Okay, all of that, I, I'm, I'm going a, a, on a tangent here, but all of that to say that experiential learning, keep it in mind, it's considered very, 
uh, advanced in the training and learning world. It's not that old in terms of a in terms of a, a notion by the specialists in the field. Keep it in mind so that I don't have to repeat this every time. I think you're going to see a lot of references to it in a lot of the texts that we're going to be looking at. Okay, uh, the next hadith from Imam Ali alayhi salam. This one we actually looked at, but now we're looking at it from another angle. Very short again. He says, "Thamaratul ilm ikhlasul amal." The fruit of knowledge is sincerity in action. To act sincerely. Acting sincerely. Thamaratul ilm, the fruit of knowledge. If knowledge has a fruit, if it bears fruit, if it is productive and not a waste of time, then it leads to the fruit of it is action that is sincere. Okay? So go back to, inshallah, we understood the action that is sincere part. Now we have to focus on, but it needs to be action. Okay? There, sincerity is important, but sincerity has to be applied to something. And this is what we ended, or one of the main points on which we ended the previous section. And we said, as important as sincerity is, sincerity remains at the level of what's on the inside, your ilm, your iman, it needs to translate into action. If you can't get to the action because you have valid reasons, no issue. But if you can't because you won't, because you're lazy, because you're not taking it seriously, because, because, these are not valid reasons. And therefore, your knowledge has not translated into action. Okay? And so this was an answer to a potential objection that someone may have, that we put so much emphasis on intention, so much emphasis on sincerity, that someone may think, well, in Islam, then it means that that's the only thing that matters. And we even said the only thing that matters is intention. In fact, we said sincere intention. But we said sincere includes within it the intent to do, the intent to act. But you have to be prevented from acting. Then you can be said that you still get the reward. It is still as though you perform the act even though you don't perform it, so long as the intent is there. So yes, it's true that all that matters is intent, but sincere intent. So if I never intended to act on my knowledge, that's not really sincere. I'm lacking the first condition. I can't really talk about someone you know, going to heaven, getting all the rewards, because on the inside they're good. That's not enough. You, had, you have to have wanted to act on that knowledge. Okay? So here the Imam says, Thamaratul ilm, the fruit of knowledge, is to act on it sincerely. To act on it sincerely. And we explained, inshallah, this in detail. Another very interesting hadith, I think, in the same vein, but it adds, as you see, a lot of these hadith are very close, but each one of them adds something. This one also adds something. The Imam here says, the knowledge of the believer is found where? It's found in their actions. And this can have multiple meanings. The general meaning, which we've been talking about, is that knowledge is only knowledge if it becomes action. And as I said since the beginning of the series, talk is cheap. Okay? Act on it. But there's another layer here. When the Imam says specifically about the mu'min, well, why, why is the mu'min different? Why is it different in the case of the believer? Because more than anyone else, the believer should be the one who speaks, who talks the less about their actions, but who does the most action, who is the most productive, who has the highest output or the, most, the, the higher standard of output the highest quantity, the highest quality. If you are a believer, then I know that you're truly a believer from your actions. Talk is cheap. So as a believer, this all of this applies to you even more than to anyone else. To everyone, we should be saying, knowledge must become action. To the believer, I'm going to repeat it a hundred times, your knowledge specifically Show it to me in your actions. Don't show it to me 
by your words and by your speech. Or even worse, not even words and speech, that it just stays inside. You just carry the knowledge. You carry a full encyclopedia or entire volumes of knowledge in your, ha- in your mind, in your heart. But what's happening with that? How is this translating into a benefit in the outside world that God is happy with? Okay, so as a believer, the standard is much higher. The more you want to be a believer, the more you need to work on this. Show it with your actions. Okay, this is going to be a theme or a running theme throughout this whole section on action. We're going to find it when we talk about the learner. We're going to find it a lot more. I've dedicated the topic really under the scholar. Okay, the one who's now carrying the knowledge. What it means. If there's one thing that it means is that this is the person who acts the most. And their actions have to show it. They have to be the most compatible with the knowledge. Otherwise, that is not knowledge. You've been deluded. Okay? So, inshallah, we we come back to this and and make it uh, a lot clearer. Another hadith from Imam Ali alayhi salam with a very interesting term in it. He says, مِلَاكُ الْعِلْمْ الْعَمَلُ بِهِ Milak is, is a very interesting term and with time it's become a huge uh, specialized term for those who are interested in fiqh and usul and we've discussed a lot of that in the past. Um, milak has become a very specialized or technical term so we leave that aside. That's certainly what not, not what the Imam salam is talking about here. Milak here can be understood as the essence or the spirit of the Knowledge. Milakul ilm, the reality of the knowledge is what? That which sustains it. That which says, you know, allows it to say that's what it really is. Milakul ilm al amalubi. The reality of knowledge is acting upon it, acting based on it. We can do a few more. I'm looking at the time. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, العلم رشد لمن عمل به and in another narration he says العلم يرشدك والعمل يبلغ بك الغاية so العلم رشد لمن عمل به knowledge is a guiding correctly guiding force or source a source of good guidance only لمن عمل به for the one who acts upon it. Knowledge is not just a good source of guidance, period. It is a good source of guidance to the one who acts upon it. Then it has truly guided them. It has shown them the way and they've acted upon it. Otherwise, the rushd is not really there. It cannot be said to be guiding you. In the other narration, al-ilmu yurshiduk, so knowledge is showing you the path, guiding you. العلم يرشدك والعمل يبلغ بك الغاية But it is your action that will allow you to reach your objective, that will allow you to reach your aim. Not your علم. علم is showing you the way, but now you have to start moving on that way. Okay? This is why you need العمل. The next narration, in awda'a al-ilm, the lowest form of ilm, in awda'a al-ilm, ma waqafa ala al-lisan, that only reaches the type, the lowest form of knowledge is the one that stops at, that only reaches the tongue. It does not make it to the outside world through your body, right? وَأَرْفَعُهُ and the highest or most noble form of knowledge, ma ظَهَرَ فِي الْجَوَارِحِ arkan, is the knowledge that appears, that manifests itself, that shows up through your limbs, through your organs, through the members of your body. Okay, It needs to show in the outside world. That's the highest form of knowledge. And the lowest form is the one that stops at, at the tongue. Okay, Talk is cheap. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, this is a, maybe we end with this. 
This is a little tiny extract from a very famous narration. I don't know, maybe one day in the series we can go through it or at some event. It's known as Hadith Anwan al-Basri. Okay, so entire uh, volumes, you know, volume length books have been written to explain or to comment on Hadith Anwan al-Basri. Very famous passage from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam to a man by the name of Unwan al-Basri. So the, there's a whole story behind it and the hadith is actually mursal. Okay, so if someone studies the hadith, they will tell you right away, hadith Unwan al-Basri mursal. So you can't, it's not 100% authentic. But the notions contain, contained in it are beautiful notions, very strong notions. So, and then when you add to the notions that are contained in Hadith Anwan al-Basri, you add the people who have reported it consistently, our biggest scholars, all of them have them have Hadith Anwan al-Basri in their in some of their books. So Bihar al-Anwar for sure, Al-Alam al-Majlisi has it, Sheikh al-Baha'i has it, Wasail al-Shia, which is one of, the, of our most important works, uh, has it, and, and others, Sheikh al-Tabrasi has it in one of his works, and so on and so forth. So, Sheikh, uh, uh, Hadith Anwan al-Basri is a is an important hadith. If you have a chance to study it, or at least to read it at some point, please do. So, this is a tiny part. So, this man, Anwan al-Basri was basically in his 90s. Maybe he was 95. But between 90 and 95 years old, when he came to Al-Madina al-Munawwara. And initially he went and studied under other people, not Ahl al-Bayt salam. And then he wanted to learn from Imam al-Sadiq salam. And initially the Imam did not want to meet with him. But then the man stuck and he really wanted to get the Imam to teach him something. So he sat with the Imam eventually and the Imam taught him. Taught him a hadith and this became Hadith Unwan al-Basri. Okay, so he says this is what Imam al-Sadiq has taught me. So he was focused on knowledge. So the relevance of Hadith Anwan al-Basri for us is that the entire Hadith is about knowledge and how to make the information that you acquire really Islamic knowledge. Okay, so inshallah one day we, we can talk about it a little bit more. In that Hadith, there's a tiny section in which Imam Sadiq alayhi salam tells him. He tells Anwan uh, al-Basri, فَإِنْ أَرَدْتَ الْعِلْمِ So now you want to acquire knowledge. So he tells him now. If you want to acquire knowledge, what do you do? فَطْلِبْ أَوَّلًا فِي نَفْسِكَ حَقِيقَةَ الْعُبُودِيَةِ So imagine today you went to someone, you told them, okay, I want to acquire knowledge, I want to gain knowledge. What will they tell you? Probably tell you, find a university course, find a course online, read this book, follow that man, whatever it may be. Okay, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says, first step, you want to acquire knowledge, you want to become a scholar or knowledgeable, the first step, فَطْلَبْ أَوَّلًا فِي نَفْسِكَ There has nothing to do with the outside world. It's between you and yourself. Internally, you have to secure something first. فَطْلَبْ فِي نَفْسِكَ أَوَّلًا حَقِيقَةَ الْعُبُودِيَةِ The reality of servitude. The reality of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The entire topic of sincerity that we finished. First thing, the Imam says, فَإِنْ أَرَدْتَ الْعِلْمِ فَطْلَبْ أَوَّلًا فِي نَفْسِكَ حَقِيقَةَ الْعُبُودِيَةِ That's the first thing. Before you start your path, your journey on acquiring knowledge, what do you do? You ensure internally that you remember and you are in a state of ubudiyah, of servitude, of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's secured now. Now we start. What do you do? وَطْلَبْ الْعِلْمَ بِاسْتِعْمَالِهِ And then you try to acquire knowledge. But how do you really acquire it? How do you secure acquiring the knowledge? By using it. Whatever knowledge you learn, use it. Apply it. If you apply the knowledge, then that's how you gain it. So that's our whole topic. Knowledge has to become action. Knowledge must be transformational. It cannot just be an acquisition of information and data. وَاسْتَفْهِمِ اللَّهَ يفهمك. That's uh, another part. I'm going to stop here. وَاسْتَفْهِمْ الله يفهمك. And seek understanding from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The knowledge that you're gaining, there is a deeper understanding to it. No matter what you learn, there is a fahm that is behind it. Where do you gain that fahm? 
Seek that fahm from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make you see the deeper meaning from what you're learning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will teach you. He will give it to you. If you seek it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will show you the deeper meaning behind this. But there's always the condition, right? Sincerity. Because you secured something first. You secured obedience. You secured servitude. Right? فَطْلُبْ أَوَّلًا فِي نَفْسِكَ حَقِيقَةَ الْعُبُودِيَةِ You have that. Now when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make you better understand, to make you see what you're really learning, the real meaning behind what you're learning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give it to you. He will make you see it. Because you have secured in yourself servitude to Him. Your intentions are clean and clear for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so inshallah we'll keep building on this. We have uh, a few more hadith to, to go through to finish this first section on understanding the importance that Islam gives to transforming the transformational potential of knowledge on us or knowledge translating into action for us. Inshallah we'll continue with that next time we meet. Wasallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi tayyibin al-tahirin. Questions, concerns, comments? So, in short, Hadith Mursal is a hadith that, uh, in which the chain of narration, of narrators, uh, is not clear all the way to the person who originally, so in our case, it could be an Imam, uh, but Mursal for Muslims in general, the infallible who says it, so it could be the Holy Prophet. The chain is, is missing. So at some point it's Mursal, right? Or sometimes they say al These are narrations in which there is a, a, a something missing, especially at the beginning. So you have perhaps the first person who says, the Imam or the Prophet told me so and so. And then you have three generations missing. And then you have the, the narration appearing in a book or appearing uh, you know, uh, uh, in a class or, or uh, someone's a scholar's uh, sayings that so-and-so has reported from so-and-so. But he can't report from so-and-so because there's a hundred year gap here. This person X cannot report from person Y. Okay, so there's mursal here. There's something missing in the hadith. Uh, it's not, for instance, where another hadith you may have every person. So if you go back in the, in the books, and you check every narrator all the way, you see all of them are there. There is no gap. But some of them are not trustworthy. Okay, Some of them are known to be, you, you cannot really rely on their reporting of a hadith because they were known liars. That would be the worst case. Or because the person who is assessing them, so it's another scholar, says you know their belief is so-and-so. So we're never sure when they're reporting something, are they reporting the truth, or are, you, are they bending the truth for their own ideological belief? Okay, that, that would be an... So, and th in these cases, okay, they might say, well, there is something wrong in his belief, uh, but he's trustworthy. So this is a person that, although we completely disagree with his beliefs, we know that this, uh, this is a man who, who says the truth. He will never, ever lie by repeating a hadith. Okay, so there's a lot of that too. So depending on which school you follow in, in Rijal and Diraya, which is the, the study of Ruwayat, then you might accept or reject or consider strong or weak a narration. So Mursal falls, in, it's one of those categories. Uh, so so I, I only said it for those, but it's an excellent question for those who follow uh, this type of thing. They, they always ask, especially for these very famous hadith or ziyarat, or you know, we often ask, okay, but is it authentic? Is it reliable? So technically, there are people missing in this chain. Okay, so we would not say this is authentic. But there's also a lot of indications. And the biggest one is the content. And this is what they do with a lot of khutab, sermons, ad'iya. You see that maybe the chain is weak, but the content of it, you know, I would dare you to go find me someone who can match any uh, this combination of content anywhere the balagha in it, or to put the, the depth of notions that we find here, to find it in 
This is not a, a regular, ordinary piece of writing. Other human beings have never produced this type of content in this way before. Or another way is to break it up and to see, well, perhaps this is not found as is anywhere, but if I broke it up, can I find and validate every part of it, the notions contained there in the Holy Quran, for instance, or authentic narrations? If I can, then, you know what, as a hadith together, I don't know the authenticity of it. I can perhaps not validate it 100%, but I know that its content, you know, the 200 points covered here, each one of the 200, I can justify them through the Holy Quran and through other authentic narrations. And so therefore, I'm going to accept it. So these are different ways of, of handling the hadith, inshallah. Maybe in the future, we, we spend more time on on this uh, this whole science, this fascinating science. Oh, there's a question. So there's a question here. Uh, it's a good question. Um, so isn't speaking considered an action? If so, would it be considered the weakest, lowest form of action? So it depends. Uh, if you're talking to talk, uh, this would not be a very worthy way of uh, uh, demonstrating knowledge. Here, there's a huge warning for anyone who learns in all of these hadith, and you will see the theme very clearly. The warning is to those who become scholars, and we'll see why. We will have even narrations that tell us why is it so bad for someone who is recognized as being someone who carries knowledge, who does not act based on their knowledge. Speaking can be extremely good. It could be the best form of knowledge. So when we're saying speaking, of course speaking is an action, one. And two, is all speech bad? Absolutely not. Go back to the histories and the stories of the prophets. You'll see basically they're preaching. A huge part of it, or the imams, a huge part of it is done through speech. The issue is not speech. The issue is, do your actions match your speech or not? That's the biggest issue. That I can say the words, that I can speak the words, does not mean anything more than I know how to speak the words. Okay, I can teach a parrot to repeat the words too. The knowledge is not in the words in that way. The knowledge is in, for you and me and each one of us, the knowledge is in, do we translate the content of the words into our lives or not? Does it stay at the level of words, which are empty in themselves? And we will see the narrations that say, how many people are those who are carrying useless knowledge for themselves, but a light for others? And they end up in hell and the others end up in heaven. So why? Because the knowledge was shared through speech to people who acted on it. But the person who was sharing it did not act on it themselves. Okay, so this is the distinction. The distinction is not specifically whether there is action happening or not. Yes, there is action happening when you talk. And when you speak, the issue is not whether the knowledge is being communicated. In fact, that could be the most worthy way, the most valid way, the most productive, beneficial way of sharing knowledge in a lot of situations with others. That's not the issue. The issue is for you, not for the knowledge and it being distributed. When there's a message being communicated, there's the person speaking, the person receiving, and the actual message. Sometimes there is no issue with the person receiving, and there is no issue with the message itself. The issue is that the person speaking, how do you secure that? And so it's always a warning to all of us, okay, when I'm in a situation of being a, a, a listener, fine, I can do that. And it, in a, a lot of cases, it does not matter to me who the person is because I can still benefit from the knowledge being communicated. And I need to go and do something good with it. That in those cases, no issue. But for me as the speaker, and this is what we're focused on, for me as the speaker, am I benefiting from talking, from sharing the knowledge? Only if, so the answer is, only if my actions match 
my words. Otherwise, I'm only creating a problem for myself. And that's why it becomes, you know, that's a longer answer to the question. It's a very low form of knowledge. It doesn't say much. It only says that you have learned something and you say you can say the words. Great. But to the extent that your actions are going to meet and match those words, that's when you know that the action is actually carried by, the knowledge is actually carried by that person. And a lot of this can never be known. This is between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? Inshallah, this was a, an okay answer. Okay. Tell um, so Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so an excellent question. Uh, in short, how do you reconcile between what we said when we spoke about um, the spirituality, the consequences and the spirituality of uh, sincerity and good actions, uh, and one of them being the alleviation or, uh, yeah, the alleviation of trials and tribulations, uh, on the one side, and what we know about the lives of prophets and saints in general, imams uh, and others, uh, and even more than uh, the examples that you gave, uh, we actually have very explicit uh, traditions, narrations, uh, and it can also be understood from the Holy Quran that as your rank, level, you know, spirituality increases in this world, then you will be tested accordingly. Okay? Uh, so how do we uh, join those two together. So what we were talking about when we talked about the alleviation of trials and tribulations, we did not talk in general. We're saying when there are tests that you are put through and you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ease those tests or make them go away, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala eases them or makes them go away. And we also said not in every case. There could be cases where you still go through the tribulation. But your chances of having your uh, your prayers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered are much greater, much higher than other people. That's what we're trying to establish there. It is not that you do not go through tribulation and through difficulty. The other topic that is associated with this, which we did not touch, which is a huge topic we've addressed a lot in the past, and we have to go back to it a lot in the future too, uh, and it falls under, you know, tests and tribulations and difficulties and the problem of evil in the world and so on and so forth. Uh, and how do people deal with it in general? From the outside, it looks all of them are dealing with a difficulty. So if you, you think, we tend to think that this is an absolute thing, uh, as though the reality is objective and absolute in the mathematical sense of absolute. Okay, so that it has the same value for everyone, that that value does not change, right? That's how we tend to think about realities in the world, but that's not how it is. You and I both get the same disease, billah, may you not get any disease, we, get, we face the same issue. We may face the same financial issue, the same health issue, the same you know, social issue. We don't deal with it in the same way. So does it mean that because I deal with it in a way that makes it look easy and someone else deals with it in a way that 
you know, gives the impression that this is the end of the world, the same issue is happening in the outside world. What makes it that one person can deal with it with so much more ease than another? Why is it, so the, the answer lies in that next question, why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts those people who have a higher level of spirituality through much more difficult tests? Because they can handle those. Because those smaller tests to them, it's the same thing that you and I would go through and to us it would be the end of the world. I can't keep going like this. I can't continue, you know, leading whatever the community and you know bringing a new religion on this planet and when all of this is happening when my son just died for instance or you know imam al hussein alayhi salam imam ali all the other imams he's in jail and so on and so forth does this not change the way we start behaving and start thinking to what extent can you remain the same person and still handle all of this because you are fully and absolutely in acceptance of the fact that you're fully submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you are in a world where these difficulties and these trials and these tribulations are going to be sent your way. That's the whole purpose of your existence here. Not to be happy because the situation you're in is seems to be a joyous one and then the next one is going to be a difficult, sad, fearful one that makes you scared. So those people are going through much greater tribulations and difficulties and yet we see that they handle them in the same way as I would handle you know things that are quite casual you know a minor inconvenience to me in a lot of cases when the truth is if I were to go through a fraction of what they're going through I would probably not be able to handle any of that and a lot of people are just focused on themselves these people are focused on a much you know, a transcendental goal, a goal that is much bigger than themselves, right? They have a mission that they are trying to achieve. It's not about me and myself and how do I manage this and my little personal affairs and it's how do I manage all of this with all of these difficulties coming my way. All of this is done for Allah and Allah keeps sending me these issues and tribulations and trials and difficulties. But I'm at peace with all of this. I'm being tested, that's one, and the people are being tested through me, that's another. And all of this is just the way it's supposed to be. First of all, the, the, the notions that we were talking about had to do with when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for prayer. So these were, for instance, when Imam Ali alayhi salam says there are calamities and difficulties when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends them and he takes some, some things away. If people were sincere when they ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will remove them from them. Okay, and he will return everything that has been taken away from them and so on and so forth. These were the examples of a hadith that we were looking at and we were saying that therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers your prayers if you go through these difficulties. That's one. So the second answer which we didn't really talk about is that the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala putting human beings through difficulties and trials and tribulations, they, they still apply. Okay, you will be tested whether you are sincere or not. And the more sincere you are, the more you will be tested. But if you are truly sincere, you will handle that. And it will not make you crumble and it will not defeat you. You will just this will just become one more opportunity to multiply, amplify your rewards. You would not get those rewards in any other way. It's not fair that two people are you know, one of them has a 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times more capacity than someone else, but you only both of them make them run, you know, the same uh, distance or put them through the same little test. You know, this is a huge scientist. This is a, you know, a 10-year-old child. And this scientist, you know, has three PhDs in his field. And you're asking them to do a little, you know, test designed for a 10-year-old child. You won't be able to see the potential of that scientist in that test. I have to design a test that will show me what the scientist is capable of doing. And then I will see. So of course, I'm going to throw a lot more his way. And then I can sit back and see, okay, this is what this person is actually capable of achieving. Right? And so we believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has engineered the world in this way. That everyone gets the maximum according to their potential. What is the maximum potential that I can reach? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give me those chances. If he gave me more, I'll break. And sometimes, unfortunately, people break. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that those people can handle this. They should not be breaking. 
Okay, so there's something wrong here. Something needs to be fixed. But they should not be breaking. Okay, and sometimes people handle it. And the more you handle, the more you are ready for handling more. Great. And the time is limited, and this is why you were created. Right? This is the purpose of your creation. That you go through all of these trials, and then some of it is happy, joyous, and some of it is awful, sad, you know, scary, whatever it may be. But all of it is trial. So that, as the Quran says, so that you're not happy and you're not sad. No matter what's going through you, this is a training program. You're going through all of these experiences so that you do not get happy, overly happy with things God sends your way and so they don't get too scared or angry or sad, grievous, grievous over things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent your way. So that you achieve that level of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, so milak is, um, as a notion, the milak is an abstract notion. In Arabic, if you were to go back to dictionaries, it would be something like, ma bihi qiwamu shay'. Right? Uh, so it, it's the reality or that by which the thing stands, if I wanted to say it literally. That which makes the thing exist, that which gives the reality to the thing. That's the literal sense. The reason I said that is because if someone is listening and they've studied a lot of fiqh and usul, you probably have first in your mind the notion as it is understood in fiqh and usul, which is the philosophy behind, the raison d'etre behind a hukum, right? Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give this hukum? Uh, in this case, for instance, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَرْشُدُونَ oh, Okay, so it's rushed. So what if... The hukum is done in a way, but it does not achieve rushd. Is it still valid, or do I change the hukum as a faqih here? And the opposite. If something else allows me to achieve the rushd that is talked about, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَرْشُدُونَ So if something allows me to reach this rushd without going through this specific ritual, can I just do that, or am I stuck doing it this way? Okay, so that's a whole discussion. Milak, illa, and so what's the real cause behind the, the, the hukum, and this is very important in usul, the principles of, of jurisprudence. It's a very big topic. Um, so that's the reason why I mentioned it. In case someone has that, so I'm saying Imam Ali is talking before, you know, the generations, generations before the scholars started talking about these notions in this technical sense. Imam Ali is using, using the term if the hadith is authentic. Imam Ali is using the term in the literal sense, okay, in the language as it is. So it basically means the reality of knowledge is the action to which it leads or that it is acted upon. Yeah. We're good.